Okay. All right, well, we have um, so far one person actually here and one person virtually here. <laughs> um, and more people come out. Um, but uh, if not, I hope people are watching this recording. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, and by the way, I brought this rock with me. This is one of my kids' pet rocks. It came along with the trip. Okay, okay. he's going to watch the play again. Name is a scammer. All right. So the big thing for today is um, imagination and reason. And I mean, in a way, this is a big theme for the rest of the course. So I mean, like uh, Schelling, uh, I think it'd be an understatement to say that Schelling is hard to understand. Um, but if there's one thing we can try to get out of him is like what the relationship between these two things is, and especially why imagination suddenly becomes so important. Um, so I'm going to say something in general about what imagination and reason are like before shelling, and then try to explain what I mean, you wouldn't think they're the same thing. <laughs> And yet Schelling says they are. So the question is uh, why or what's going on there? Um, and and um, let me turn this off. Um, and this is going to be. Uh, key to understanding why art suddenly, I mean, that's, you know, one of the main topics of the reading today, but this is going to be key to understanding why art suddenly seems to be um, similar to, perhaps a competitor to philosophy, or perhaps the same as philosophy, or anyway, there's suddenly a close relationship between the two, which you previously might not have expected. Um, so, so first of all, what is imagination? So imagination is, you know, one of the traditional lists of faculties or powers of the human soul and, and the other animal souls. Um, uh, right, that is, it's, it's recognized in Aristotelian psychology. Um, in Greek, it's called Fantasia. In Latin, it's called imaginatio, obviously, and in German, it's called Einbildungskraft. <laughs> so, right, this part, built, means picture um, or image. I guess more to the point, right? And imagination is the faculty of images. So this is like in imaging power. Um, so um, so what is this faculty or capacity of the human soul? So classically, it's understood as um, the faculty of either deliberately or involuntarily quote unquote, seeing or hearing, et cetera, invented mental pictures or sounds, images, or, you know, or other sensible images. That is at least supposedly um, every sense, to every sense there corresponds a imaginative capacity, just as you could imagine seeing something, you could imagine feeling something, et cetera. Whether that's true or not is a good question. But in any case, that's what people usually assume. I think Schelling doesn't question that either. Um, and so, um, right, so it's the faculty of like seeing, 
multiple images. Um, and therefore, it's also um, involved in dreaming. Right, Aristotle's explanation of what dreaming is, and I mean, and this explanation from Aristotle continues straight into the early modern period. So, for example, this is also Descartes or Spinoza's explanation of what's happening in dreaming that the imagination, the senses are shut down, and the imagination is kind of goes on on its own. Um, and because the senses are so shut down in that context, the, the images, um, without any reality to compare them to seem real. <laughs> and that's why, you know, in, when we're dreaming, we, um, we take these, these mental images to be real things. But also it's maybe more fundamentally, it's involved in memory, right? Where memory, if memory is understood as recalling what has previously been sensed, at least, so, so the faculty of memory involves calling up images of um, like image versions of things we've already sensed. Um, so, I mean, the, like even with this description of the faculty, you can see that it's actually. Um, pretty important to any kind of rational cognition. Um, in fact, in um, non-human animals, Aristotle says it um, takes the place of reason, right? And how, how, how does it take the place of reason? Well, so I guess similar to or somehow related to memory is I mean, Aristotle, when he discusses this, actually says that this depends on memory. I mean, and it, but it's more, it's more specific than just memory, it's association, right? Like, like the way the animal knows to avoid something is because it's gotten harm from it in the past. When it senses it again, um, its imagination calls up the image of that harm that it got from a similar sense thing. And that's what makes it afraid and, and try to move away, right? So it's it's the kind of thing you could do using um, abstract concepts and reasoning, right? You could say this is the same kind of thing that I saw before, and therefore, etc. But um, if you don't have that, then um, imagination can take the place of it. Um, so, uh, which, you know, um, when you get to Hume, he says, oh, and by the way, that's when we reason about matters of fact, that's the only thing that happens anyway. Right? Just like those supposed non human animals. Uh, which, so, I mean, so he actually says non human animals do have some share in reason. But, but, you know, because reason is, like not actually such a big deal as we thought. It's pretty much imagination. Um, um, okay, but I mean, so so that's Hume, but getting back to more like um, the Aristotelian or rationalist way of thinking about this. So for example, Leibniz um, is um, says as Aristotle does, basically, that yes, this is how non-human animals decide things. And then so he adds that, um, you know, the beasts are empiricists. <laughs> <laughs> they learn from experience, they empiricists think we do. But humans have a better way. <laughs> um, right, so, um, um, so, so according to that tradition, imagination is definitely, you know, is a poor substitute for reason, but, it, but it's, it's similar enough to reason that it could substitute for it. But more importantly, um, they, uh, Aristotelians already say that when the understanding or the intellect abstracts concepts, 
from our experiences. It doesn't do it directly from sense. It does it from images provided by the imagination. So, um, like how to explain exactly what, how Aristotle speaks to that means is be really complicated. Uh, or at least, I mean, if I were to try to understand how all the different Aristotelians think Aristotle thinks it works. Um, and, but, um, but, you know, because Aristotle says that they all agree, at least that somehow or other, the imagination is a necessary stage towards forming abstract concepts, even in us. And you, I mean, you can kind of understand why that is, right? In order to form a universal concept of dogs or whatever, you have to experience dogs over and over. And then that will be no good if you can't remember the dogs that you already experienced, right? So imagination is going to be involved. Okay, but in Kant, in some sense, Kant just takes this over. Um, Kant defines imagination as the faculty of intuitive presentation even without the presence of the object. So what does that mean? Well, you know, I mean, it basically means the same thing as this, right? Even though the object is not present, I can call up a kind of sensible intuition of it. Um, and um, again, in Kant's part of the function that the imagination therefore gets is that it mediates between sense and understanding or intellect when we try to when we form or apply any kind of abstract concept. Um, but I guess um, uh, so. Even though, like, when you summarize it on that level, it sounds like there's no change. Um, um, Kant understands that function as being like. Uh, but much more deeply involved in the use of any empirical concept. And I mean, it's, it's so it's something like this. He actually uses the example of the concept dog. I spent a long time trying to figure out how to draw a dog here. It's clearly not a horse. But I probably know what to do that idea. That looks more like a sheep. All right, I don't know. Anyway, this is a dog. <laughs> So, so, you know, how does the concept dog re represent dogs? Well, um, so the concept dog, this is a dog, and this is the concept dog in my mind. And the concept dog, I mean, it's a rule of to which something must conform if it's to count as a dog. That's basically the way Kant thinks of it. Um, and at least in simple cases, you can think of it almost like a list of, of, you can think of it as a list of the characteristics that something has to have to be a dog. Kant usually does think of it that way, although, I mean, I think really even for Kant, concepts have to be more complicated than that somehow. But, that neck is growing. So, um, um, so, but the problem is that, so here's the way the dog affects my senses. You know, this is my eyeball here. Um, the dog, like the image of the dog that, or, or the impression of the dog I get from my senses never shows all of those characteristics. I mean, just on a simple level, I don't see the whole dog. I don't see the inside of the dog. 
right? So, um, and I don't see the whole temporal evolution of the dog, right? I mean, if there were something that were like, in terms of its spatial structure, exactly like a dog, but it only existed for two seconds, and before that and after that was nothing, then that wouldn't really be a dog. <laughs> okay. So, right, it wouldn't have the right kind of causes and effects and whatever to be a dog. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things that are missing in this, in when I, when I sense a dog. And on the other hand, there's all kinds of stuff like inextricably mixed in with this sense impression that isn't necessary for this to be a dog. Um, and I mean, not only because the dog is seen against the background or whatever, but because different dogs are really different from each other, right? And, you know, um, something could look very different from this and still be a dog. And moreover, it's not just that it could look randomly look different. There's like, you know, I mean, if I tried to put the, just if this were a chihuahua and I just tried to stick a great game head on it, <laughs> that wouldn't be a dog. That would be like a monstrous combination of two dogs. Well, that reminds me of, there's a Woody Allen. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about Woody Allen anymore. Anyway, there's a Woody Allen joke about it. A mythical beast that's of it. It has the body of a lion and the head of a lion, but it's a different lion. <laughs> anyway, so it's a dog. Right. So um, um so there's actually like um there's a kind of um way that something has to affect me to count as a dog, but um but the way any actual thing ever affects me doesn't either exhaust that or um, um, uh, or consist only of that. It's always mixed with this extraneous stuff and it's always incomplete. And so in order to apply the empirical concept, I always have to um, apply other sensations that aren't really there, so to speak. And also I have to like exclude some of what is there. And so Kant says that's a function of the imagination. Right? The function of the imagination is intuitive presentation even without the presence of the object. I guess you could say, or not not intuitively presenting even with the presence of the object. <laughs> he doesn't say that, but I think that's also part of it. So, um, so to every empirical concept, there corresponds what Kant calls a schema. And the schema is like the method the imagination has for proceeding with sensations in order to present them as an image of this concept. So each concept has a schema yes. compared to it. Yeah. And so, so Kant says, you know, it isn't concepts directly that apply to objects. It's concepts via their schemata. Now, I mean, Schelling already has talked about schemata earlier. I mean, he skipped most of it says a lot about it, he skipped most of it. Um, and, you know, he's interested in this kind of schema. He, like Kant, is especially interested in what does this in the case of transcendental concepts, like cause and effect or whatever. And the answer somehow is time, is, is, is like the imagination schema for presenting these uh, transcendental concepts. Um, um, but uh, um, but I guess the important point here, or the, the, the interesting point here is that although, like I said, this is a much more, a deeper involvement of the imagination and cognition than Aristotelians usually give it, um, it still basically keeps the structure intact. 
right? So the imagination is between sense. It's like a lower faculty. It's a faculty of the sensible part of the soul, not the rational part of the soul, but it's the one that kind of borders on the higher faculties. <laughs> right? So, um, um, okay, so that's the general picture of the function of imagination in Kant, except for one important thing, which is the way Kant says that imagination functions in aesthetic judgments. Right, that is in appreciation of art. And um, in that case, Kant's explanation of what beauty is is that um, in the case of an aesthetic judgment, the imagination is like uh, engaged in free play, meaning that it's going through the sensed object, but not in a way that um corresponds to any possible concept and what beauty is is when the object facilitates that free play of the imagination so it's like adapted to the form of our faculties it's it's uh, we want to stay with it because it allows us to exercise our faculty freely um okay so that's the imagination are there questions about that from either of you just one about the, the schema so the schema is sort of like a road map or like road site for the imagination on how to get from an instance to concept yeah okay. yeah it's he calls it a procedure Sometimes he calls it an art. So not in the sense of fine art, which is what we're talking about when we talk about aesthetic judgment, but just in the sense of, you know, um, techne, like craft, right? It's something, yeah, it's something that imagination does um, on behalf of concepts, for the purpose of concepts. And again, I think, uh, that this is also supposed to explain why non-human animals, um, assuming non-human animals completely lack um, intellect and reason, why they nevertheless are able to, um, which which for Kant means really they don't perceive objects at all. Uh, I mean, I, well, I won't get into why, but I, I mean, you think, I think you can see Shelley would agree with that also. But, you know, um, nevertheless, they, in many ways, uh, respond to objects appropriately. And the reason is because they have an activity that, like, in us, would correspond to concepts. So, um, so we can, that's why we can, we can treat them as thinking. This actually also is similar to what Aristotle, actually it's similar to what Aristotle says about women, unfortunately, but in case it's we're also similar to what he thinks about non-human animals that, you know, they can be described as reason insofar as their faculties are fit to, to obey reason later, even though they don't have it. So, um, yeah, so that's what it is. Okay. Um, right, so now I'm going to talk about reason. So, like, so far I've been kind of like mi mixing up understanding and reason. But let me draw it. So, there's a fuller catalog of Kantian faculties. We have sense, imagination, understanding. Right, so um, 
So reason, right, and German term is very new. And the uh, Greek term is logos, right? So, um, you know, uh, it would be interesting to, to try to explain exactly how reason ends up being a higher faculty than understanding the way uh, Kant describes things. It doesn't exactly correspond to pre kantian ways of thinking about it, but I, but, um, but anyway, so Kant describes it as a higher faculty than the understanding. Why? Because it's the faculty of first principles. I mean, it's actually, he calls it the faculty of principles. Which, uh, but principles are first principles. I mean, principle means first, right? So, um, so, so what does the faculty of principles do and what makes it higher than the faculty of understanding? Well, first of all, so reason is the faculty of inference. Um, this has, this is some, some part of the story why this ends up being the highest faculty, but so the logical employment of reason, which is not sees it, is inference. And so why is the faculty of principles involved in inference? Because inference is, is syllogism. A is B, right? Like all A is B, all B is C, therefore all A is C. Um, the way Kant understands this is that this is like a way of judging that A is all A is C, but um, with an explanation, which is this, which is this major premise. That's the explanation why all A is C. And that's the principle, right? So it's understanding this as related to its principle. Now that's, I mean, that's principle only relative to this inference. And that's what always happens in logical use of understanding the part of But um, but there's also a trans, uh, sorry, the logical use of reason, but there's also a transcendental use of reason. In, um, reason in its transcendental use, according to Kant, has its own special concepts. And those special concepts are called ideas. So I hope you can see if you, if you did the reading or tried to do the reading why I'm getting into this, because Schelling says a lot about ideas at this point, all of a sudden. So he's alluding to this thing in Kant, the transcendental use of reason. So the transcendental use of, why is it called transcendental? Again, I think it's because these ideas are supposed predicates of ob the object as such. Or they're, they're supposed principles of object as such, I guess would be the way to put it. Um, but, um, th but there are things that, um, are infinite or unconditioned somehow. That's why they're put to serve as first principles. But that also is why, according to Kant, they can't ever be given in sense. So what are these things? Well, it's basically the rational soul ego. Um, the world as a whole and God. Those are the three ideas of reason. Three transcendental ideas of reason, according to Kant. Um, 
So, you know, so Kant says, like, since these can't be given in sense, we actually can't, for theoretical purposes, say anything about their objects. They're, they're, they're unknown to us and unknowable by us. And for theoretical purposes, therefore, the function of these ideas is only regulative. Like, it tells us, um, like, for example, this one, the cosmological idea is its true function is, for example, that when we find the cause of some effect, we know that we shouldn't stop there, but we should always look for another cause and push it farther back. But um, the, because it tells us to think of the world in respect to cause and effect and other respects as a, as a finished totality, that can never be given in sense, but the function of that representation is to tell us never to be satisfied with the conditioned object of sense, but to always keep adding to it, right? So, however, when we treat the objects of these things as if they were objects of sense and try to, to know about them from a theoretical standpoint, then we arrive at contradictions. So, I mean, actually, in Kant, this only applies to the cosmological idea. He doesn't, there's no antinomies um, with respect to this first idea or this third idea. The antinomies all come up in here. But uh, most of the post Kantian idealists seem to kind of forget that or something. <laughs> or, and a lot of people have to talk, actually. So, um, that, that they think of the whole manifestation of the fact that these ideas can't legitimately be applied from a theoretical standpoint as the fact that it gives rise to contradictions. Thesis and antithesis, which both have proofs. They both have indirect proofs, right? So for example, the thesis says that there's a first cause in the world that um, that doesn't depend on a previous cause. That is, there's a free cause in the world. And the antithesis says um, there is no free cause in the world, but rather, you know, everything is determined by an infinite series of previous causes. And the thesis gets proved by showing that the antithesis is absurd. And the antithesis gets proved by showing that the thesis is absurd. <laughs> right? And that's the way all the antinomies work. So, right, and, and so the solution is just slight variation in the solution between different ones. But basically, the solution is both of the proofs are correct because um, yeah, either way you try to finish off the causal series, it's absurd. In reality, a finished, complete causal series can't be given to us, can't be given to us in sense, and therefore it can't be an object of theoretical cognition at all. Um, so that's how um, these ideas function in theoretical reasoning. But there's also the practical use of reasoning according to Kant. The practical use of reason is to give moral principles, including, and well, that is basically the famous categorical imperative, right? That's the law of reason. And so, in the practical philosophy, it turns out that there's a moral use of these ideas that's legitimate, right? Like, so for example, the moral use of the idea of God is the idea of God as the executive in the kingdom of ends, right? The being who will ultimately reward um, uh, all finite rational beings according to their work. So it's, and it's, it's, it's basically, it's Locke's God um, is, the, is the object of the idea of God in its practical use. Um, okay, so that's the role of reason in the practical philosophy. 
And what about um, the so-called third critique, the critique of judgment, in particular the part about aesthetics? How do the ideas of reason turn up in there? And the answer is that um, um, the imagination is able to treat nature as a symbol of these ideas. So, um, Right, this, the, the, the free play of the imagination in its aesthetic use is, um, is able to treat sensible things as representing the infinite. Now, uh, I think I, I raised the picture here, but, but you can kind of understand why that is from Kant's point of view, because like, a concept represents something as following a certain rule and therefore as determined and limited by that rule. And when the imagination schematizes the concept, it presents a finite thing as finite. <laughs> but it presents the finite thing as corresponding to some particular rule. But um, when the imagination responds to an object of free play, then that's kind of like unlimited. There, that's the, the reason it's um, uh, free play is because there is no particular rule that it's trying to correspond to. And, so, and therefore, natural beauty can, in general can serve as a symbol of the ideas of reason. Um, Okay, so all of that was Kant, but I think now we get to, we get to the point where we can see why the imagination becomes so important in Shelley, and ends up going above intellect <laughs> um, because that imagination, Schelling says, is the faculty that mediates between the finite and the infinite. Let me, I guess, address this part. I mean, so, by the way, I should say, I keep going back and forth between understanding and intellect because Actually, the German word Verstand and, and the English word understanding, in fact, in this period, are the usual translations of the Latin word intellectus. So, um, so like, for example, when Kant talks about the intelligible world, he treats that as synonymous as a world of objects of the understanding. So, um, and it's worth emphasizing that to understand the relationship between Kant and his predecessors, like Spinoza or whatever. But it's also worth emphasizing that to understand what's going on in, in Schelling, because he oftentimes uses intelligence, sort of as the Latin word, but he's thinking of Kant. So, um, all right. So, anyway, um, so like, of course, we know from, from Kant or even from Aristotelians that the imagination plays some kind of mediating role. But especially thinking about that third critique role. The presentation of the infinite in the finite. So from Shelley's point of view, Um, remember that, you know, there's the infinite, there's the finite real objective um, ego, and there's the infinite ideal subjective ego. And when we're trying to um, represent the finitude of 
the, the finite really though as the positing of the ideal infinite ego. You know, we're, we're looking for a standpoint that's like neither of these from which we can see the relationship between them. Or as Schelling um, often puts it, he says, we're, you know, there has to be an activity that hovers or he's for some reason often translate this as wavers. The German word is um, the German verb is schweben, which really means to flow or to hover. Well, I mean, uh, wavers is more like schwanken, right? Anyway, so uh, there's an activity that like hovers between the finite and the infinite, and and it's higher than both of them because it's the one that reflects on the relationship. Yeah. Was this uh, what he called absolute abstraction? He's uh, looking at. Well, it's so, I mean, this is where it gets confusing. And I know, like, you know, when you read the very last part of the reading, which is the end of the book, there's this summary of all the stages that we've gone through. Um, and I don't know about you, when I read this, I was like, okay. I, I mean, I guess I didn't remember my disappointment from two years ago. <laughs> I was like, okay, like here he's going to lay it out and I'll be able to follow. But no, it's okay. just like it's even harder to follow in the summary. <laughs> it just seems like the same words are being used over and over again. It's almost like a tongue twister. You know, sub subject, object, subject, object. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it is kind of like, it seems like we do this over and over again, getting this standpoint. Um, you know, I mean, the difference is supposed to be between, you know, that is, there's really three times we do it, right? There's transcendental abstraction. Well, okay, you know, maybe this is, transcendental abstraction is, There's transcendental abstraction, there's willing. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's, you know, uh, artistic genius. Product of artistic genius. And I mean, they're all kind of the same thing, but it's like, and that's why he sometimes says that it's the same thing raised to a higher power. <laughs> Again, I don't know exactly how to understand that metaphor. I mean, what is it? Why is it multiplied by itself rather than added to itself, for example? Um, I mean, I guess you can kind of like that's that's a metaphor for reflection. They that that. So when, you, when you multiply two numbers, the, the number tells you what to do with itself. Right? Like when you add two numbers, there's the number, and then you're doing something to it. But what you're doing has nothing to do with the number. But when you multiply two numbers, I think this is the metaphor. You're using the number itself as a guide to what to do with it. How many times will I add it to itself? As many times as itself. Right. So I, you know, so I think that's like that's the best I can do understanding that metaphor of higher power. But but the point is so like the difference is supposed to be that it's more reflective or more conscious as we move from this to this to this. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, I wish I could explain more coherently or in a simple way. I mean, it, it, like Shelley does explain it in that general remark, but as we both just agreed, it's really hard to understand each other. So is it like maybe different stages of how clear one is about oneself and the process of the act 
of being oneself. Yeah, but I mean, but it's supposed it's supposed to be it's supposed to be more specific than that, right? That's kind of vague. Like, to get clear about that. But these are supposed to be three definite stages. Right. So this is definitely the last one. And you know, I mean, so like, I mean, I guess I can, I can try to kind of explain it. You know, so in transcendental abstraction, you um, when you form a concept of an object as such, your um, your um, acknowledging that uh, there's really just one activity that's involved in all these sensations, and that it's your activity, but um, um, but you don't understand that that's what goes on. Right? I mean, it seems like you're just uh, introducing the most abstract possible concepts that every object must adhere to. So it's only from a higher point of view that we're able to see that that's what you're acknowledging. And similarly, in the case of willing, it's, I mean, without trying to explain exactly what the difference or similarity is between these two, but at least you could say similarly in the case of willing, you're, you know, um, no, I guess, no, I can't say why this is more. So you do know that it's your activity, right? And you do know that your activity has like preeminence over the object. But you still, what you still don't understand is that this finite object that your will is directed against really just is an expression in finite form of that infinite principle of your will, right? Like the fact that, remember, like the reason you need external intelligence is to act is because in itself your will is the power to do everything, right? So, um, so in this case, um, uh, so, you know, I mean, sort of following Kant, but maybe put in like the consequence, what's in, in Kant the consequence, making it the definition. Shang says that, you know, what beauty is, is the finite representation of the infinite. Um, So I got a little bit out of order of my notes here, but let's see. Yeah, because I was going to say a little bit more about, I was going to say a little bit more about the theoretical role of the imagination and the practical role of the imagination, according to Schelling. Um, I mean, it's kind of along the lines of what I was just saying, but may, maybe it's not exactly the same thing, but maybe it'll help understand that too. That, you know, so that the imagination, according to Shelley, is always, right? So that imagine, you know, I have to draw it a different way, right? That there's, you know, there's like, the real activity, which is basically theory, slash sense. And then there's the ideal activity. I guess there's different stages here. Maybe I should draw it this way. The first stage, the real activity is sense and the ideal activity is concept. The second stage, the real activity is theory. And the ideal activity is practice or will. But in any case, what hovers between them what 
intermediates between the finite and the infinite. In each case, is the imagination. And so, in the theoretical philosophy, um, the imagination is really already doing this, but because um, the, what's objective is not known to the intelligence to be an object of its own infinite activity, or to be a product of its own infinite activity. Is there something you can't read here? I is it uh, practice the real activity and theory the ideal activity? Well, um, no, I don't think so. No, I mean, I know what you're thinking because practice because the practical philosophy is realist. Yeah. And the and the uh, but um, um, in the practical philosophy, the ideal activity becomes known as an object that's opposed to other objects, namely other intellects. Um, right, I mean, it's one of the paradoxes that he said that is, is that, like, in the practical philosophy, the illimitable ideal activity will have to be limited. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and how is that possible? Well, the details are all those details about the system of intelligences and their pre established harmonies and the way in which they don't directly limit each other, but they do indirectly limit each other. Something like that. So yeah, no, I, I, I think I wrote them on the right side, but I mean I wouldn't swear to it. I think I wrote them on the right side. So um, um right, so in the in the in the theoretical, you know, so in other words, um this is like part three. This is part four. Um, so all of part three is theory, but then in some sense in part four, this whole structure, right, the subject object becomes the real, um, as opposed to the ideal activity, which is the will. Um, yeah, so I think that's right. So in the, um, in this stage in the theoretical philosophy, the um, um, because the, the intellect itself doesn't know that the sense that the sensation to which it's trying to apply its concept is actually its own product. Um, what the imagination does to mediate between these two is to provide a finite procedure, which is the schema. Can you explain that better? Um, Right, it's like the, this infinite ideal activity of the ego um, the imagination is going to allow it to see how these two sides can fit to each other, how they can be in harmony with each other. Um, but at this stage, its object is, is, is limited, is finite. So the imagination um, that that mediation of the imagination appears to it as something finite. 
And that finite appearance is what Kant calls the schema. Schelling also calls it schema. Right, but 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 but, but, Schott, but Schelling is saying it's only from this point of view that that's what it looks like. So in other words, it looks like in every case of empirical abstraction, this has to be done again. It's like, um, I mean, if you think, like, imagine that, that, that dogs were made by our representation of them, then we wouldn't need a special finite procedure for applying our concept to the dog. Right, because the you know this rule by which we're representing the dog would also be the rule by which we make them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's so 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 this mediation really would only be done once and for all here essentially. Does that make that make more sense? Yeah. So but here because we can't see that overall truth, mm -hmm. that, that this whole thing is just you know a different way of the infinite ego representing itself. We instead we see a finite procedure for doing it in each instance. Um, um, whereas in the practical philosophy, what happens is that um, the infinite now the infinite ego understands the finite object as subject to its own infinite activity, its will. Um, so um, this is some of what he talked about uh, at the end of part four. This is on page 175. Um, Actually, I changed the translation so much. I think you're going to read my translation, but it's on page 175 in the book. Once again, the ego could not become aware of this act as such if willing did not become an object for it. This, however, is possible only that an object of intuition becomes the visible expression of its willing. But every object of intuition is a determinate one and must therefore be this determinate one only because and insofar as the ego has willed in this determinate manner. Only so would the ego itself become the cause of the matter of its presenting. So, so this, this is an explanation of why this, the, 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 recognition that the object is subject to my infinite activity in the practical, from the practical standpoint, still doesn't result in, um, still results in me being focused on just this one finite object. Um, it's in order for my will to become an object for me, I have to see it presented in intuition. And I still don't have the, the standpoint that will allow me to see the infinite in a, a finite object. So instead, what I see is um, that the object should conform to my will. <laughs> that's what I will for it. And uh, then, you know, when I act, that's what I go on to do. Um, so, in, so in willing also, I think uh, Schelling doesn't emphasize it as much there, but in willing also the imagination is essentially involved and the, the way it's working is a little bit different though, right? It's, I mean, at least in the, um, in ordinary cases of, of willing determinate things, um, it's, uh, I mean, the way we normally think of it is that we, you know, 
we're using the imagination to imagine how this dog could be changed if I do something. So it's, you know, so we have an intuition of the object without its presence. Um, we have, you know, like if I want to, I don't know what, wash the dog and the dog is dirty. So like my, my impression of the dog is as a dirty dog. And in order to will that the dog be washed, they have to form an image. Um, so it's, um, it's better than this use, this theoretical, theoretical use, because it does acknowledge that um, the dog as it is, is, you know, is subject to my activity. Is like um, is uh, subject to cancellation or change by my activity. So its its finitude or determinateness is um, um, only so long as I let it subsist that way. Basically, <laughs> um, I'm in a position to change it. Um, so like exactly, I mean, so far that makes sense to me. What is hard to understand, but, but obviously super important is exactly how these ideas of reason come in to build. I mean, I understand how they come into practical philosophy for Kant. Um, and I know that when Schelling talks about the practical philosophy, um, the next page after the, the part I read, he starts talking about these ideas. Um, this is his explanation of it anyway. Um, well, maybe I should start farther up on the page. So through willing, there straightway arises an opposition, and that by means of it, I am aware on the one hand of freedom, and thus also of infinity, while on the other hand, I am constantly dragged back or drawn back into infinity by the compulsion to present. Right, so you know, so on the one hand, I'm aware of the infinite power compared to which this dog is um, just a product. Um, but on the other hand, like at each stage, whatever I do, I'm still presented with a finite thing that's not necessarily the way I want it to be, and and I I need that because I still I need a way of representing that infinite power in a finite intuition. And at this stage, that always appears as opposition. That's, that's what he's saying about, I always get dragged back into finitude. Hence, in virtue of this contradiction, an activity must arise which wavers or hovers in the middle between finitude and infinity. For the time being, we should call this activity imagination, because they haven't shown that it deserves to be called that yet. And then skipping down a little bit, this power, therefore, which we refer to meanwhile as imagination, will in the course of this wavering or hovering also necessarily produce something which itself hovers between infinity and infinity, and which can therefore also be regarded only as such. So that, that's, the, that's the step that's important that I don't quite understand, but I guess that the idea is that The imagination is somehow involved in um, it's the standpoint from which I can understand that there isn't a contradiction between my infinite freedom and the determinate circumstances in which I have to apply it. 
but the fact that I'm faced with a world that already contains substances and I can change them, but I can't create them out of nothing, you know, whatever. Like, um, um, maybe, I wonder if it's also related to the contradictions about like the canal going out in the part. I'm not sure, anyway, I just thought of that, so I shouldn't try to about that. But so in any case, there's a kind of contradiction there, and the imagination is so. I mean, I just explained in an ordinary way why the imagination, how the imagination is so to speak involved in resolving that contradiction. The imagination shows that although yes, I'm confronted with this definite finite thing, um, uh, I already have something like an intuition of the way it could be otherwise. That's what that's that's how my infinite freedom is consistent with its finite existence, I guess you could say. But what I don't but 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 these are supposed to be products of this. What Sean is saying is that these are products of the hovering UEA thing itself. I guess you could say they're transcendental products by this. Right? They're like, um, um, not the specific resolutions of that contradiction, but like the general resolution of this. And he says that these products have the same feature of wavering or hovering between the finite and the infinite. Now again, he he goes immediately to the to the antitheses or the sorry, the antinomies of reason, and he, he says, you know, and this is why, like for example, the, the representation of the of the causal series, like we want to represent it as finite, at least in prior time. Right? We want to represent it as having a beginning. And on the other hand, we want to represent it as infinite. And if we try either one, it doesn't work. That's like the hovering. I, I guess in that context, you could see why you want to translate it as wavering, but it doesn't really mean wavering. But anyway, <laughs> so, or oscillating, he also translated. I think it especially doesn't mean that. Um, so, but in any case, it's like, um, I guess, Schelling is, is diagnosing these, so like Kant's diagnosis at this point is that the theoretical standpoint and the practical standpoint are just different and we have to keep them separate. And so like, for example, from the theoretical standpoint, we should never admit a free cause into our explanation of anything that happens. Whereas in a practical standpoint, we must admit the existence of a free cause. And the only function of the um, of the system overall seems to be to keep those separate and make sure they can't contradict each other, right? Like to explain why it is that, and, and that, you know, and the reason is basically this: from a theoretical standpoint, we can't think the whole process of series. So, although. Uh, um, Um, we can't think it as finite, we also can't think it as infinite. And maybe that wasn't the best explanation in the world. But anyway, so the, so, so the point is, like, what we learn from this according to Kant is, to avoid these contradictions, you have to keep theory and practice separate. Um, although, uh, in the third critique, Kant himself, and that thing about symbolism is, is presumably part of this, um, Kant himself in the third critique indicates that the aesthetic can serve as a kind of bridge between the theoretical and the somehow, but he doesn't explain very clearly how that is. Um, so, um, 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 so in any case, whatever, whatever Kant that thinks, Schelling thinks that these antinomies are just a symptom of the fact that 
Not that, that we don't know the, well, I mean, we don't know that it's, he agrees that it's not the object of theoretical cognition, right? But not that we can't supply an object for these ideas. But we haven't realized that the, the proper object for the ideas has to be hover between the finite and the end. So we're trying to make it one or the other, and that's why we have the contradiction. So, in other words, the right we're we're getting a contradiction because we're caught. We're trying to do one of these, with it, basically. But if we can move to this standpoint, the contradiction will go away, because this is the fact that we that is the fact that we are both the things that are both find that in each other, <laughs> right? So. Um, um, so, and this is going to close off the system because, again, um, like what's been happening the whole time is that what was originally united. The ego, the self, has been divided into these two parts. And so far, stage after stage, all we see is different versions of the division. But now we understand that this faculty of imagination is the one that, if we could apply it correctly, would allow us to see these things as united again. Because again, the faculty of imagination is the faculty whose object is both finite and different. But so, um, um, so in part five and part six, there's two versions of how the imagination can allow us to see the same object as both real and ideal or both finite and infinite. Um, and uh, once we've done that, the system will be finished, right? So this is on two thirty-two um, before the general observation on the whole system. There's a kind of conclusion. Um, we therefore close with the following observation: a system is completed when it is led back to its starting point, but that is precisely the, precisely the case with our own. The ultimate ground of all harmony between subjective and objective to be exhibited in its original identity only through intellectual intuition. And it is precisely this ground which, by means of the work of art, has been brought forth entirely from the subjective and rendered wholly objective in such wise that we have gradually led our object, the self itself, up to the very point where we ourselves were standing when we began to philosophize. So the point is. So somehow this, the imagination in the process of appreciating a work of art, somewhat as described by Kant, is um, because it's allowing the self in its intuition of a finite object to see the unity of the finite and the infinite. It's allowing the self that's undergone this separation to see this original unity. And so, and that's why it, it's allowing the self that we're studying to see what we're seeing as transcendental philosophies, right? It's allowing the, so the self in, re, in responding to this work of artistic genius is, um, is standing at the point where we stood at the beginning of the book when we said, well, the ego is one, but it divides the tongues. <laughs> That's, that's, that's the basic idea. But then, like I said, this, this part is, um, this part is confusing why there's part five and part six. 
Part five is about natural teleology. Whereas part six is about that. So um, what I don't exactly understand is whether natural teleology is somehow a stage that we have to go through between between practical philosophy and the aesthetic philosophy. Um, I mean, the placement of part five between part four and part six suggests that this is one of the stages that we have to go through. Um, and as I mentioned before, I think these, the critique of judgment, the third critique, the cross third critique, has these two parts. First part about this and then a part about this. So, uh, so, so it would seem that Schelling is saying, although Kant, Kant doesn't say that they're two different stages, actually, right? I mean, he just treats one after the other. But um, there's, you, it would seem that Schelling is saying, yeah, um, after the first critique and the second critique, Kant had to write the third critique with these two parts because these are the stages. However, number one, he doesn't really explain how, as opposed to what he does um, in similar cases elsewhere in the book, he really doesn't explain how, you know, we get from this to this. And in that general observation at the end, it seems like this phase is missing. He goes straight from practical to aesthetic. So possibly, I'm not sure, possibly he thinks of this stage as kind of a dead end, right? I mean, he, he does say a lot of critical things about teleological explanation of nature in part five. And it's possible to read that as meaning, and I, I mean, I do, I tend to read it as meaning the wrong kind of teleological explanation, the kind that doesn't understand transcendental philosophy, but it's possible that he thinks the whole thing is really a mistake. And then Kant shouldn't have put this part in. <laughs> but anyway, um, but nevertheless, I mean, whether this is a mistaken version of this or a preliminary version of this, they are kind of versions of the same thing. Um, when we regard nature as teleological, so, right, teleological means purposeful, or purposeful. I'm not really sure what the right way to think of it is. Anyway, people tend to say purposeful, but I'm not sure that's correct. Well, anyway, sorry. So, um, right, teleological means like having a purpose. Now, um, um, well, I'll just read how, how Schelling explains this. This is on page 216. Um, in the natural product, we still find side by side what in the free action that has been separated for purpose of appearance. Every plant is entirely what it should be. What is free therein is necessary, and what is necessary is free. That is, a plant. Um, um, so what he's saying is in practical activity, in free activity, for the purpose of appearance, he means for the purpose of appearance to itself, the necessary and the free have to be separated. Um, right? Like, again, there has to be an object that confronts me on which I can exercise my work. But in the plant, these two things are still are, are not separated. And the way he puts it is they're not separated yet. They're still united, right? Because um, the object on which the plant exercises its freedom is the plant itself, <laughs> right? Like, um, so the freedom and the object of the freedom are the same. Um, and the same goes for any like natural thing that we think of as having a purpose. 
its purpose is itself. Um, at least that's the way he suggested we should think about natural teleology, I think. Unless maybe he's suggesting we shouldn't think about natural teleology at all. But I, I think he's suggesting like the way we should think about natural teleology, right? Like there's a kind of teleological explanation of natural things that um you know like grapes were created so human beings could have wine or something like that, right? Where like everything is connected to an external purpose. Or like I think Leibniz, someone makes fun of somewhere. Is it making fun of Leibniz? I don't remember where this comes from. The idea that uh, noses were created so there would be a place to put eyeglasses. <laughs> That's not the way to understand natural teleology. It's not that everything was created for someone else's purpose or for our purpose or something. It's that everything is its own purpose. And that's the way that, that in the natural product, these things that are separated for us are still combined. And so we could regard them as, but the way Schelling puts it is, you know, we're seeing them the way they were before they were separated. So, I mean, if, if this is a dead end, then that's because that's not enough. We need to see them united as they have become separated in us. If it's a stage, then that it's still because it's not enough, but now it's like on the way to enough. <laughs> That's, I'm not sure which is the right way of understanding it. But anyway, in the case of art, we're supposed to see them united after their separation, reunited. Um, So, um, oh yeah, actually, maybe I think I do understand this better when I wrote this note. What sense are are we? Is the natural product of these things still united? Well, because in the natural product, it's like before consciousness. So um, this is what he says on page 219. Um, um, the organic Product reflects its unconscious activity to me as determined by conscious activity. So, meaning that the plant is not really conscious. It doesn't really have a will. Why am I drawing this plant? I don't know. <laughs> the plant doesn't really have a will. It's not really conscious. It's so he's saying it's so to speak pre conscious. It hasn't come to regard itself as an object. Um, and yet it, um, it presents itself as if it were the result of conscious activity. That's the teleology. So the way that, uh, think of this as the unconscious and this is the conscious. The way we see the unity, unity of the unconscious and the conscious is in the unconscious. <laughs> we see them that way, actually, I don't know if said it that way. But anyway, right, we, we, we see freedom and necessity united in necessity, or we see unconscious and conscious united in unconsciousness. It's a way of unconscious things being conscious, so to speak. Um, right, Hegel says that a living thing is just a concept realized in the world. Right, like the difference between um, 
the plant and us is that we have a concept, but the plant is a concept. <laughs> it's a concept without the consciousness that for us goes along with the concept. That's that's what it is according to Hegel. So I like I think Schelling is thinking something something similar along those lines. It's not, I mean, I said before it's as if it's conscious, but at least assuming natural teleology is not just a mistake, it's um what Shelley is saying is that um, it actually is a kind of consciousness, but it's an unconscious consciousness, right? Just like that thing about a concept without a mind to entertain it, so to speak. Um, that's what's going on here. So on the other hand, in the, in the artistic product, we're supposed to see the conscious and the unconscious united in the other way after the separation that is with consciousness. And that's what Schelling says, that's the continuation of the same sentence I was reading, right? Whereas the organic product reflects its unconscious activity to me as determined by conscious activity, the product here being derived will conversely reflect conscious activity as determined by unconscious. So, um, that on first sight might seem harder to understand. I mean, this was already pretty hard to understand. I have to say, a lot of times before you nodded. <laughs> but, I, um, but, uh, but you know, in what in what sense is it true that an artistic product? Um, presents something conscious as unconscious. Or something like that. So the reason is because he's thinking of, and this involves a perhaps restriction in what we mean by art, which I think Schelling is happy with, that he's thinking of art as the product of genius. And he's thinking of genius as, quote unquote, the dark unknown force, which supplies perfection to a work of art without the artist's conscious compliance. Right, this is the, the way he defines it on page 222. Um, um, that incomprehensible agency, which supplies yeah. objectivity to the conscious, without the cooperation of freedom, and to some extent in opposition to freedom. That's what to denominate by means of the obscure or dark concept of genius. So, right, he's talking about this experience and he says, he says this is what artists always say, or artists of genius, I guess, at least, always say about their experience, that it's, you know, that it's as if um, something came from above and, you know, without their understanding it made this work of art greater than they could have consciously intended. Um, so, uh, just a few minutes left, but I think I'm almost done. So, I mean, the one thing that's important to notice about this, well, I mean, first of all, it's important to notice this whole thing because going forward, I mean, first of all, in Coleridge, we're going to see a different understanding of the a role of the dark unconscious force in the will. Namely, he's going to associate that with grace. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, uh, but, you know, with all these people going forward, this importance of the idea of genius and art and the way it's somehow could be seen as white philosophy only better. <laughs> um, and, and, and one way in which that's true, perhaps, is so, I mean, so first of all, the way um, Right, so we have the plant, which is like the 
like unconscious consciousness. And now something over here is going to be like conscious unconsciousness. And, but what goes here is not actually the artistic genius themselves. It's the product of the artistic genius. So it's the work of art that goes here. <laughs> well, I guess that, that could also be the genius. Well, anyway, that's supposed to be the work of art. So, um, because after all, the whole point is that the artist, when they were making the work of art, up until the time they finished it at least, um, didn't know how to make it a work of genius. So it's even for the artists themselves, the point at which the unconscious and the conscious or the finite and the infinite are presented in unity is when they look at what they've made and it gets reflected back to them and Schelling says that. But for the same reason, this, um, this unity here is not available only to the artists. It's available to everyone. And so Shelley says that, you know, um, art and philosophy are parallel in this respect. Shelley says the talent for both of them is very rare. Um, but there's a big difference, nevertheless, because the rareness of philosophical talent means most people just have to have access to it, according to Shelley, at all. But the rarest of artistic genius doesn't mean that other people don't have access to it. They, in a sense, have the same access to it as the artist has. <laughs> and so Schelling, I mean, Schelling actually does say that the function, one of the functions of art is to present the truth of transcendental philosophy in a way that people can understand without philosophical. So the, the progress of making art isn't like it's not important so far as it's like the end of the trajectory and the system fulfilling it's a it's just a product that well yeah well it's just it's the product but it's but it is only the kind of product it is because of what that process is like yeah, yeah. Right? i mean because you know because people can make art just using skill and following rules and whatever and then they will make a product but it won't have this character um yeah so it's it's good i guess i mean the reason it closes the system is per se because it's finished it's not the process. Yeah. Once yeah. the artist has put the finishing touch on, and that's the one that they couldn't account for that came from, right, then the unity is there. Okay. All right. I'm over time. So um, thank you for coming, and thank you for coming, Aldrich. I hope you don't fall off that rock. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'll hope to see you uh, next week. Bye. For sure.